Welcome to today's Navigating Drought webinar with NDSU Extension. Um, a couple housekeeping things before we start is please put your questions in the Q&A box. And if you want to chat with the other attendees, you can put that in the chat box and make sure that you're selecting so that all participant panelists and attendees can see your message. Um, and then these are recorded. So if you do have to jump off for some reason, you'll be able to find the recording for this webinar on the NDSU drought website under navigating drought webinars. Um, and as many of you know, the new drought map came out today and then we'll be talking about that a little bit further, but currently 99% of the state is in drought um, and 17% of that is at the exceptional or the D4 category. So things are definitely intense here in North Dakota and thankfully we've had some rain and that's helped a little bit. Um, so I'm Miranda Meehan. I'm the Livestock Environmental Stewardship Specialist with NDSU Extension, and I have Lisa Peterson here co-hosting with me. Uh, I'm with the Central Grasslands Research Extension Center near Streeter, and I also serve as the state's Beef Quality Assurance Specialist. Welcome. Before we get started, we'll introduce our other panelists. So we just want to start with Adnan, please. Adnan Akhuz, uh, North Dakota State Climatologist. All right, Kevin. I'm Kevin Sadovic. I'm the Extension Rangeland Management Specialist and the Director for Central Grasslands Research Extension Center. Zach? I'm Zach Carlson, the Beef Extension Specialist located in Fargo. Travis? Travis Hoffman, uh, Extension Sheep Specialist with a joint appointment with North Dakota State University and the University of Minnesota. Right, Carl? Hi, I'm Carl Hoppe. I'm the Extension Livestock Specialist located here at the Carrington Research Extension Center. Tim. Tim Petrie, Extension Livestock Marketing Economist in Fargo. And as I said, we'll get started um, it, with our discussion. Adnan's going to give us an outlook. We want to thank everybody that registered and submitted questions. So any our discussion today is going to be based off those questions you submitted. And again, if you do have any questions as we move along through today's presentation and discussion, put those in the Q&A and we'll make sure that we get to them. And Miranda, Dr. Jerry Stuck, our Extension Veterinarian and Livestock Stewardship Specialist, uh, will join us as soon as he gets done with his other commitment that was supposed to end around one. So he'll jump on too if, if he can get here. So um, Adnan, can you provide us a drought update and outlook? Absolutely. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, hello from Fargo, uh, from the campus. Uh, just like the, uh, the weeks before, I am going to start with the National Drought Mitigation Center's national map. Uh, and just like Miranda said, that map is published uh, this morning at 8 a.m. Uh, you're looking at some D4 areas in North Dakota that, that was left over from last week. Uh, it was the first time this uh, drought season D4 or exceptional drought was introduced. Uh, this this season, however, uh, it it was introduced in North Dakota three times three times total, 2006 and 2017, and and the reason why I am displaying the the national map so you could get some uh, the perspective of the other uh, drought areas to the southwest and it looks like the uh, the northern plains North Dakota is experiencing the only D4 area. And the map on the right hand side is the, uh, the four week change. And as the other drought locations uh, either didn't change or uh, degraded by one category and North Dakota is also degraded uh, by one category uh, during the past four week period. And that is in the D4 areas. And there you are seeing some blue or green areas that uh, uh, is indicating uh, conditions are getting better by, by one category. I'm gonna escape out of here and then go directly to uh, seven months. Uh, the prior to uh, the, the current month, uh, you're looking at the October uh, to April precipitation. Uh, this is the water year. And many locations in North Dakota is the driest during the past 126 year period. At the same time, uh, temperature ranking on the right-hand side is a really bad combination, having warmer than normal condition and drier than normal condition, not to mention that the North Dakota is experiencing the driest 126 year period during this, this period. So it is uh, the kind of telling you 
um, how dry the condition had been during the uh, long period of time. Uh, there are four uh, cities that I would like to, uh, to show the precipitation accumulation. Uh, since October 1st, uh, the, uh, the graphic on the left-hand side is Bismarck, and on the right-hand side of the Williston, uh, the brown color is indicating the normal accumulation since October 1st, and the green accumulation is the 2021, or 2020-2021. And how uh, the green line is closer to the red line, which is the minimum, and during that period shows you how dry conditions are. Uh, so it looks like um, Bismarck is experiencing the um, sixth driest during uh, this period since 1873. Uh, the four Williston, that's, uh, ranking is the fourth driest uh, with 3.16 inch uh, departure from normal uh, for the period since 1893. And uh, the next graphic is going to show me two more cities. Uh, one on the left-hand side is Fargo accumulation and the Grand Forks accumulation is on the right-hand side. Fargo is currently experiencing the sixth driest and Grand Forks is experiencing the ninth driest period since uh, 1881 and 1892, respectively, for Fargo and Grand Forks. Okay, this graphic is showing the, uh, the short-term uh, total precipitation on the left-hand side. This is a 30-day. Uh, the red areas are indicating the, uh, the high precipitation areas, and as the blue uh, locations are indicating low precipitation. Uh, we had some blessingly uh, significant precipitation that fell, especially to the Southwest. Uh, the amount is 5.26 inches. That prompted uh, for improvement of the location, especially Stutzman County. However, some locations, especially the North Central location, uh, the precipitation was there. However, it wasn't enough to make any difference. And therefore it prompted some deep poor areas to extend into these regions. And map on the right-hand side is showing percent of normal, 200 and 38% means it is little more than twice as much, much precipitation falling during the last 30 day period. And still on the Southwestern locations, uh, the precipitation uh, between uh, 1.9 times to 2.17 times as much precipitation falling. But because of the long duration of the drought, uh, it really didn't make any difference for these areas, um, except for a small area uh, that received uh, the greater than three inches of uh, the rainfall uh, that implemented uh, D2, D3 conditions to be downgraded to D2. And if you're looking at the 60 day uh, percent of normal uh, precipitation and the blue colors are indicating above normal and uh, yellow and blue, uh, red colors are indicating drier than normal. Even 60 day period uh, during the past three week periods of precipitation contaminated that data. You have to keep in mind that the three weeks of precipitation was so significant. Uh, it made up the 90% of the precipitation falling during the last uh, seven month period. Um, even looking at the 90 day periods, uh, that uh, precipitation uh, played as, uh, as above normal precipitation. Looking at the, uh, during the last 180 day, so this is a 60 day percent of normal. Still some areas are uh, significantly improving, significant precipitation that prompted to improve the drought conditions in that area. So if I am showing the drought monitor map that just published this morning, that's uh, significant precipitation, uh, even in 180 day periods um, made us, gave us no choice but improving conditions from D3 into D2, but still uh, you have to keep in mind that uh, any counties uh, adjacent to or any uh, boundaries that is touching D3 conditions are, are still intact. Nothing changed for those, uh, the counties, but we are just obeying the, uh, the precipitation percent of normal to uh, give an accurate depiction on the drought monitor. The other uh, difference is that, that Northeast extension of the D4 uh, into Rolette and Towner counties, uh, which uh, aggregated the D4 or exceptional drought areas to 18% that improved, that didn't improve, but that increased the area, aerial coverage by 1%. Uh, D2 
conditions didn't change, it is still 93% of the, the state is on the D2. Uh, what made a major change is the D3 uh, the area is uh, subtracted by 8% to make it 77% of the state is under extreme drought. And D1 areas uh, improved or extended by 1% that added 5.3 thousand people being under drought, uh, which, which made a total of 663 uh, and a half thousand people uh, in North Dakota is under some kind of a drought. Four week change on the left hand side, uh, the brown and yellow colors are indicating degradation by one category, green colors in indicating improvement by one category. On the right hand side, it is 180 day or six month change. So uh, the big question is, yes, we did improve some location, but we, we added some D4 conditions, but the, in, in overall, uh, the SCI or drought severity and coverage index is a good way to uh, look at how statewide, uh, if the conditions improved or uh, degraded. Dated. Uh, so uh, drought severity and coverage index is 386 which is uh, six point less than what it was last, last week. Uh, it still is the highest, uh, the so far um, in, in record since 2000, the second highest number was 329, that was in 2006. And the, the second highest was, uh, rather third highest was the uh, 295 value in 2017. So looking at the aggregated or accumulated drought impact. Uh, so uh, what it is doing is the calculating the area under the, uh, the curve to give some kind of indication of accumulated impact, which is 10,987, which uh, surpassed the 2008 uh, drought accumulation by uh, 300 points. So, uh, Comparison to 2008 drought, since we just surpassed that area, that should show us some kind of an indication at the end of the drought season, what kind of economic impact we would expect in North Dakota. And we have to keep in mind in 2008, the economic impact solely on North Dakota was uh, 500,000 million to $1 billion. Uh, so soil moisture ranking percentile on the left-hand side is the shallow layer. On the right-hand side, it is the deep soil down to three feet. Uh, shallow layer down to three feet, or rather than four feet, I should say, showing some improvement. And it is amazing how fast that map uh, show that improvement. Uh, looks like on the Western, especially Southwestern locations, uh, portions of the state that received two plus inch of rainfall uh, only impacted uh, the shallow layer. Uh, however, it didn't make any difference except for that little sliver area that is receiving more than three inch of precipitation uh, that impacted the uh, deep soil. Uh, if you look at the rest of the state, still uh, brown and the darkest brown colors are still indicating between one to two percentile ranking in these regions. This map on the left-hand side is showing the SPI or the standardized precipitation index. It is solely looking at the precipitation and comparing with the normal. Uh, and all these dark colors are uh, the D4 worthy. Uh, map on the right-hand side adds the temperature um, and evaporative demand of the atmosphere. So it subtracts evaporation from the precipitation before the standard does standardized precipitation index algorithm can be implemented. During the, uh, the last week, southeastern portions of the state were above normal temperature. And at the same time, uh, northwestern portions of the state was uh, below normal. And therefore, uh, it didn't do too much impact to the northwest, but uh, did play important role in the southeast portions of the state to make the SPEI, or the standardized precipitation evaporation index, to uh, be uh, still D3 to D4 worthy in that areas. Uh, the grass cast, uh, this really didn't change uh, since, actually since last time we met, it did change since we are meeting once a, once a week. The map on the left-hand side, this you still have to keep in mind that this is an off peak for the cast 
uh, GrassCast. The map updates once every 15 day. Uh, so this is valid for May 18. On the left-hand side, it is indicating the, um, the grass land productivity if the precipitation from now on into uh, August 31st happens to be above normal. Uh, map on the middle is the near normal. Map on the right-hand side is the below normal uh, scenario. So uh, looks like the, the trend is showing more like the, uh, uh, the middle part of the, the map, but the forecast is showing more like the, uh, the map on the right-hand side to be more applicable. And the red areas are showing below normal productivity. Some drought responses. Uh, this is uh, some summaries that is coming from the county agents reports uh, the weekly to see more. Uh, so uh, as a summary, uh, it, it acknowledges some heavy rains, but uh, uh, also acknowledging that the, uh, how the dry soil, the extreme dry soil absorbing it uh, very quickly to uh, immediately stop the runoff into the empty drug, dugouts and the ponds. And also it is acknowledging the high wind, uh, the events uh, which increase the potential evapotranspiration and loss of the water immediately into the atmosphere. And because of those regions and, and some D3 uh, reduction uh, in southwestern portions of the state where the precipitation was above uh, three inches. So I would like to show some pictures. Uh, this, uh, the particular picture is coming from Carl Hoppe. Uh, from Carrington, and he's he's one of our speaker, and he took this picture and pointed the camera to uh, the the grain bins uh, that is about 1.25 miles, and uh, you might see that what is wrong with this picture that uh, you barely can see the grain bins from that distance. It is all blowing, uh, blowing dust, uh, and this is despite the fact that the area did receive prior to two day prior to this period. Uh, the point, almost 0.9 inch of precipitation. So uh, some pictures coming from uh, Mercer County and all these pictures are uh, submitted to see more by the county agents. Mercer County on the, uh, on the left-hand side, a dry uh, dugout and the Ward County um, indicating uh, dry seeding into the field and how the dust um, is uh, showing that the, uh, how dry the soil is. Um, some more pictures from the Pierce County. Uh, the, uh, the cows are still congregating into what looks like the, uh, or what should be uh, the wet, uh, so they can drink. Uh, on the right-hand side, the Sheridan County, um, uneven or no, um, the grass growing. Uh, this was uh, the fall seeded hay crop on the right-hand side. Uh, and the county agents is indicating that normally a foot tall of a, uh, and the grass would be uh, the scene in this photo. Uh, we have been asking these questions on the frost, uh, the latest frost uh, and in impact of the, uh, the late frost actually. The blue colors on this map is indicating the, uh, the frost uh, temperatures uh, 32. Uh, you have to keep in mind that these temperatures are measured at five feet above, uh, above the ground and the most canopy levels down below uh, the could be exposed to much lower temperatures, temperatures as much as five degree Fahrenheit lower than uh, it is advertised at five degree, uh, the five feet above the ground. And on the right-hand side is the minimum temperatures uh, today as this morning, some 31 and 32 degrees uh, that was measured on the north uh, eastern portions of the state as well as southwestern portions of the state. And believe it or not, uh, some snow events were uh, reported in these and that portions of the state. So I'm gonna briefly come out of my PowerPoint to show you uh, the, where these uh, the snowfall events were reported. So if I can find that map over here, this is the snowfall analysis. Uh, yes, uh, there are two regions in the United States snowfall. One is the, uh, the Rocky Mountain regions and the other is the North Dakota region where you see this blue, blue areas. So, um, Going back to my PowerPoint presentation, and I am really interested in knowing from the county agents the impact of this late frost. And uh, I would like to uh, archive that uh, impact reports uh, for uh, North Dakota. Uh, you would normally find these kind of late frost 
uh, at the 10% probability. So this map is showing uh, the probability of 32 degree happening at a later time. So all these pink areas and the magenta color areas are indicating May 29th to May 31st or June 1st to June 3rd. And this is a 10% probability the late frost is going to happen later date than advertised in this map. Um, outlooks, uh, looking at the minimum temperatures uh, for Friday, and this is indicating uh, tomorrow morning's temperatures, uh, 30 degree and even lower than uh, 30 degree in these portions of the northeastern portions of the state and north central portions of the state. And this is going to be even lower than the temperature that was experienced this morning. So this is going to be third time, <coughs> third time this month, that late in the season that the frost is going to happen. So I am really interested in looking at or receiving county agents reports for uh, the frost impact. Seven day periods, this is the, um, the weather prediction centers, the QPF or quantitative precipitation forecast had been given us so far a great predictability. Uh, green areas are indicating precipitation of 0 0.1 to 0 0.01 inch, but the blue colors just to the south and south central, probably 0 0.25 to 0 0.5. So this map had been a blessing uh, during the past three week period and having precipitation one inch and greater and had been very uh, proper. Uh, so it is indicating that this week, uh, it is the, the precipitation events is losing its punch. And you will see in the, uh, the later forecast that uh, we are getting into cooler and drier period. Uh, looking further, uh, eight to 14 days, uh, this is the, uh, the second week that is gonna take us into June 3rd, nine period precipitation on the left. Hand side is the near normal precipitation returning to North Dakota, especially the Western portion as the Eastern portion is remaining in above normal uh, or weather than normal conditions. Uh, at the same time, temperature wise, uh, warmer than normal second week, uh, moving into between four, June 5 to 18, equal chance of having above below or near normal conditions and precipitation and temperature at the same time. Uh, looking into uh, the month of June, uh, we have a split region on the western side or the, the western half of the state uh, has a better chance of having warmer or uh, should better say drier than normal conditions. And, and as the eastern portions of the state is having above, below or near normal or equal, that is an indication of having uh, the models having no uh, skill to break the tie. However, we are more sure about the temperature, temperatures in the, uh, the June, uh, and this agrees with the European forecast that the above normal temperatures are returning in June. Precipitation wise in June through August, this map, uh, this, uh, uh, the forecast didn't change since May 20, um, and still showing uh, below normal precipitation during the summer months in Western uh, portions of the state. At the same time, uh, the greater chance of having warmer than normal conditions in the Western uh, North Dakota than Eastern North Dakota. Uh, that concludes my um, pre presentation. I am going to stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Adnan. Uh, while we have a chance here, we'll ask Dr. Jerry Stuck, our extension veterinarian, to introduce himself. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah, this is Dr. Stucka. I'm the Extension Veterinarian and Livestock Stewardship Specialist at NDSU. Thank you. Miranda, county agents have been receiving a lot of calls regarding water quality. Uh, what are they documenting and uh, in their screenings and what screenings are they completing? And then what options are um, available to producers who have water quality issues? Yeah. yeah, so most of our county agents are screening water samples and getting lots of calls while of screening these water samples for livestock consumption. Um, results are variable all over the board from completely fine and, and no impacts to livestock to off the charts high levels of total dissolved solids, so greater than 10,000 parts per million, which are deadly, as well as for sulfates greater than 2,000, which in a grazing system 
can be toxic and and induce um, some central nervous system disorders, which I'm sure Dr. Stucco will expand upon. Um, and so what we're, the immediate responses is, is the first question we always get is, what can I treat it with? Unfortunately, there is not an option for treating these waters. So the best option is finding another water source if you can. Um, and if you need, still, still need to use that pasture, which in most cases you do because grass is limited out there, that fencing that source off or excluding. We also recommend consulting with your veterinarian to see how the levels that you're, you're getting from your tests are comparing to normal levels in your region and, if, and see what their recommendations are because there is a lot of natural variability in total dissolved solids and sulfates across the state. Um, and then also the screens, the methods we're using, it's just a screening and we really highly recommend that if you get high levels in the screening with the TDS meter or the sulfate test strips to submit a sample to the laboratory for analysis. So you're better informed of what you're dealing with and you can share that information with your veterinarian. Okay, thank you, Miranda. Yes. And then, oh. Um, Dr. Stucca, if an animal's been utilizing a water source that's high in TDS or sulfates, what steps should be taken to keep uh, those animals healthy? Yeah, Miranda just kind of answered that question. When we get into those, those areas where most of the, of the water is actually evaporated, the only thing left behind are the salts. And so you're basically having cattle drink salty water, which means they don't want to drink very much of it which kind of complicates the issue as well. And one of the first things you might see is animals that are a little bit loose out on pasture. And of course, when you turn cattle out on green pasture right away, they can be a little loose, but the water can, loose manure, I mean, and water can certainly add to that when it's high in what we call the total dissolved solids. And a component of that at times can be high sulfates, which is what Miranda was talking about again. And high sulfates are a problem because it, it leads to the formation of hydrogen sulfide gas in the rumen, which is extremely toxic to cells and particularly cells in the brain of the nervous system. And, and so that may result in a condition we call polio. And uh, that's a very serious condition that if you're very fortunate and find them early on, you may be able to treat them and reverse, reverse the course of that disease. But if you can't, that's an animal that's gonna end up dying on you. And so anything that makes you think that the water quality isn't what it should be, and I looked at some of the dugouts recently, and the, those that are only uh, filled by water runoff, not in other words, not springs, but just water runoff from the surrounding area, you're gonna see that they're really down in, in normal levels. And that's a clue right then and there that you may have a problem with at least high total dissolved solids, not necessarily sulfates. And that's what you need to test for to make sure that you don't have those lethal things going on. So what, you know, and I've, I think I've told a couple folks this already that if, if the moisture doesn't come and our, the runoff is almost non-existent or very little and those things don't get char recharged, those ponds and stock ponds don't get recharged with runoff, it's a problem and you're gonna end up falling water. And that's an issue because if you have very many pastures and very many head of cattle, that's a, that's a full-time job for one person. So those are all the things that need to be considered. And, you know, many of us don't have a big enough water tank and tanks, uh, portable tanks we can set in the pastures. And so be prepared, I guess, if, if it comes to that situation. Thank you, Dr. Stuck and Miranda. During drought, we know that uh, cyanobacteria blooms tend to be increased in nature and increased in frequency. When these, um, when do these typically occur and what do producers look for? Yeah, so typically in a normal year, we see these type of blooms occurring late June, early July, um, but with the, high, the hotter, warmer than average temperatures and with our water sources being drawn down, we can expect that we'll be seeing those earlier. And even last year, we seen them as early as the beginning of June. So I would definitely start scouting for those now. Watch those water sources closely, um, what you should look for. And there's a link to a publication that has some pictures. 
in the chat box, but is the most common one we see is one that looks like um, teal paint on the surface of the water, but there's also ones that look like grass clippings, green scum. So there's some variability in the toxic species of cyanobacteria and what they look like. Um, so that's, that publication is a good resource. Also our Department of Environmental Quality has a map where they monitor um, the harmful algal blooms across the state and those ha have pictures associated with the points. And so that's another helpful resource of just getting a better idea of what's, what to be looking for. And unfortunately there isn't a good test that's affordable. And so just a visual assessment is the best way to um, know if you have something and you can test, send it to our veterinary diagnostic lab at NDSU for a microscopic analysis to see if the toxic species are present. Okay. Uh, Dr. Stucka, um, what, what impact does cyanobacteria have on livestock and what should producers do if they have a bloom within their water sources? Yeah. So let me say first, uh, for, the, for those of you guys out there that are color challenged, teal is actually kind of blue green can color. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> so normally we see these blooms, now the, the environmental conditions have to be right. And normally we see it with a little more heat. It's 41 degrees right now in Bismarck. And so we, we normally have to have heat to, to kind of result in this algae bloom. And what's interesting about this, that the only thing we can test for really is, is the algae species itself that can cause this, this syndrome to occur. And, and it occurs because the algae produce toxins in the water and there's a neurotoxin and a, and a liver toxin that kill cattle. And, and the truth of it is they kill mammal, um, basically all mammals if, if exposed. So this is not only just a risk to, uh, to cattle, but it can be a risk to even your dogs. And, and other wildlife. So if that's the only water source and you see an algae bloom, you know, just be thinking about those things and think about what can I do to, to maybe change the water source? Because for most relatively large bodies of water, the ability to, to treat uh, those bodies of water is, uh, is pretty limited. So think about what you can do to, to provide water, just like in the case of high total dissolved solids and or sulfates in the water. Thank you, Dr. Sucka. And I just, another thing that I, is probably important to point out is um, that if you have an animal that you think died fr from cyanobacteria, potential poisoning, that have a necropsy done on that animal because we, for to be eligible for some programs on the livestock indemnity program, does cover losses to cyanob due to cyanobacteria dur during drought, but we need to have proof that that was the cause. And so that's something to keep in mind if you think that's the cause of a livestock loss on your operation. Yeah, thanks. And thanks, Miranda. That's a great point because, you know, there are other reasons for why, for why animals might die close in the pasture or close to a watering facility and it, everything from lightning strike, which we kind of hope for lightning strikes actually right now. But anthrax, even an animal that's running a fever is going to be a near watering source in many cases. And so there can be a quite a number of reasons why an animal might die. And so that's a good, very good point. Thank you. And, and if you have any water problems, be sure to reach out to your local FSA office. And there are several programs available right now that do provide assistance for hauling water um, or development of water sources, both through FSA, but then we also in North Dakota have a state water commission program, which you have to have a letter from FSA before you apply for that program. So visit with FSA and they can help point you into the right direction. Um, so moving on from water, um, Kevin, what have you, from what we've been seeing across the state, and I know both of us have been traveling the last week or so, you know, grass development seems to be on track. However, production is lagging. Um, and what should ranchers expect for forage production on both tame grass and then on native range in this in in the coming year or this this growing season. Sure, I mean that's a great question, and and like today I'm sitting south of the beach, and where they've got some moisture out here, and and when you look at you look at your exotic grasses first, which looked at you're looking at crested wheatgrass or smooth brome grass. Um, I think one thing is the rain really came a little bit too late, 
in the western part of the state for even giving you a nice bump in terms of crested production. So I would, you know, I would expect for producers who rely on crested wheatgrass as their hay production, that I would be surprised if they get about 50% of normal production because of the timing and, and the growth phenology of crested wheatgrass. I think smooth brome grass is a little, it's about a week later than crested. Um, and we got some moisture in the western part of the state. Those in the north central part of the state, I think you're going to be in trouble no matter what we look at, if it's brome grass or crested or any grasses are going to be extremely low in terms of production this year, where we're still experiencing these areas that didn't get the fortunate rains that we've seen in western North Dakota or even the southern part of the state. So your hay grounds are going to be at best 50 percent. Um, and there's going to be some, some producers who may not even have enough grass growth to, to bring out the mowers and cut them for hay. So. I would think, you know, if, if it was me, I'd be looking at ways to what am I going to do to offset the, la the lack of forage production on my hay fields, whether you bring in an emergency crop like a, like a millet or a sorghum sedan. Those of you that got some rain lately, you got some really good topsoil moisture. So it's a great opportunity to look at adding another forage source that you can use for hay production. When we look at pasture development, I think these rains, those that got the rain, this definitely will help pasture production. Um, our native range has really been about phenologically ready to be grazed about this week, maybe give or take the last week. And some of the warm seasons, of course, are still about two weeks away. Um, so moisture occurring at this time period really will help those pastures green up and you should get some biomass on those production areas. I think most producers are still gonna expect a 20 to 5% loss of production, even with the moisture we have. And those areas in the north central part of the state now is up in in uh, Towner a couple of days ago is up by Harvey. Uh, those areas just did not get much rain and, and the pastures are still pretty brown. Uh, I would suspect those areas, even if we get normal rain in the month of June, are gonna be at 50% at best. Those in the West will probably be at 25% uh, production. And some of them areas got a lot of rain. You might actually see normal production in a few outlier pastures. And so I think a lot of producers have been looking to turn out to pasture. Um, I think it is time to go out to pasture. Um, even our native range is getting close to being ready. And so I would look at grazing those pastures. Um, I get the question, should I, should I keep delaying turnout uh, to, to make up for this lack of production? And there's a point where, where grazing is beneficial to grass production. And so I think it's important also to realize you need to, need to go to pasture at some level to get that grazing effect. So you can keep it in the vegetative state. So when you do get rain, it'll continue to grow and elongate. So I think it's, you know, we turned our, our cows out to pasture this week and we tried to capture that, that we got a lot of Kentucky bluegrass so trying to capture that bluegrass. So, you know, I think even though we got some rain, production will still be low. And I feel sorry for those areas in the north, north central part of the state. They're just going to not produce a lot of biomass this year and need to figure out strategies for, for, for lack of production and also strategies to, to, to put up some more hay in those emergency situations. So you touched on this a little bit, but how much rain would we need to make up for the de deficit, um, and when would that and when would that rain need to occur? That's a great question. So if we get the western part of the state that's gotten that two, three, four inches of rain, you know they still need to get another. And I'm talking about in the month of, of June, they're going to need to get another probably three to four inches of rain to to what I would achieve above normal precip to where they can get you know at least normal production. In that north central part of the state, that month of June, they're gonna have to receive at least seven to eight inches of rain to at least get them back to normal production in terms of rainfall. That still will not give you normal production in terms of grass growth, but it may get you at least to where you're at at least a 30% reduction versus right now they're looking at 50% loss of biomass. In those areas from Rugby to Botno, over to Towner and down towards the Carrington area are just really dried. So, um, and the odds of getting that, if you look at the, the, the per, per percentiles over the last 30 years, to get seven inches of rain in the month of June, your odds are less than 5% to do that. And so I know producers are always optimistic. We always hope for the best, but your odds of getting that kind of rain are pretty low. And so I would be looking at strategies to be prepared for that, for not getting that, and what you're going to do in terms of, of providing forage for your livestock. Thanks, Kevin. Um, one more question, and you you did start on this, and but to elaborate a little more, um, if somebody is considering planting an annual forage to make up for that reduced hay production, what options should they be considering to get optimal forage production from those acres? That's a great question, and I think there's a couple. There's still numerous options we can look at. I think we're 
we're almost getting a little bit too late for the cool season cereals like a forage barley or a forage oat. Although I still think that it's an option to put those in a cover crop mix. Um, if you're looking at an an of a annual for hay, uh, to me, the droughty areas, the Siberian foxtail millet is probably one of your best options. You can look at German millet and the sorghum sedans, an area that have some moisture. Um, those will be very high producing grasses if the moisture continues to occur in the month of June and into July. I think a cover crop mix is also a great option, especially if you're looking for something to graze. You know, a nice mix of a forage cereal, like a forage barley and a millet. You can add some brassicas in there to give you some quality. And they'll be great choices for grazing in that months of July and August and September. The question I get from producers is, can they plant something that has value for haying first, and then they can come back and graze that? And if that's what your objective is, you want to reduce your brassicas in your mix. So don't put too many turnips and radishes in the mix. You want to focus more on the grasses like a millet or a forged barley or even a sorghum sedan if you have the moisture in the area that you can harvest for hay. And then when, it, when you take it off your regrowth then the brassicas come through there and you get a nice uh, regrowth potential for late fall grazing uh, when you got to come off those pastures. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, Zach, and welcome to our team, Zach. Zach actually officially starts with us next week as our extension be specialist out of Fargo. Um, Zach, some annual forages have higher risks of accumulating nitrates during drought and even during normal growth, but especially during drought. What species have that higher risk? And yes, what should producers, uh, what, what per, um, excuse me, what should producers that are concerned about uh, nitrate accumulation do? Yeah, thank you. Uh, just to build off Dr. Sedovic, what he was talking about in terms of options of uh, types, warm seasons be those millets, sorghum, sedan grass, or those combinations, sorghum, sedan grasses, as well as maybe sunflowers and corn. If you're looking into some of those, uh, those are going to be your nitrate accumulators for warm seasons. And then looking at cool seasons, your small cereals, oats, barley, uh, wheat and rye, those are going to also be nitrate accumulators as well as brassicas. So uh, <clears throat> primarily those will be of focus uh, when talking about nitrates. Now, we always talk about nitrates when it comes to stressing that plant. Drought, of course, is one of those major stressors. And so really, uh, first and foremost, what's most important is to know what you have. And so you need to be out there and, and uh, sampling those forages prior to grazing, or if you're going to harvest those as hay, you want to sample that as a standing forage. And so there's a great uh, resource here at NDSU with the uh, nitrate quick test and the uh, your local extension agents should be able to get you in contact with, with uh, being able to test your samples. And if you're going to do that, uh, I advise you to, to take those samples, of course, as standing forage, uh, collecting them and, and uh, uh, getting those frozen as fast as possible, storing them on ice until you can get it analyzed. And then, uh, but uh, if, if uh, you end up not being able to sample those forages uh, as standing and now you have hay that you want to know what you have in, in terms of nitrates, you can also do that. But, but that's, uh, that's a different test that you'll have to send off, uh, much like uh, sampling uh, for hay quality and whatnot. So uh, first and foremost, getting that test to know what you have. Once you know what you have, uh, then, then most importantly, uh, you'll want to test that water as well for those locations in those field sites. So uh, uh, that water could have additive nitrates uh, that would then compound your, your uh, nitrate toxicity or risk of nitrate toxicity. And so knowing what you have for water and managing that, managing that much like you would for those total dissolved solids, and avoiding areas of high concentrated nitrates in those water sources once you have them sampled. And then once you know what you do have, uh, really it's gonna be a matter of, of turning cattle out uh, to graze these, these annual forages and making sure they're full when they do go out. Uh, giving them, uh, filling them up prior to grazing is always a great practice uh, just to allow those cattle to uh, move through and not fill up on maybe uh, some of that higher nitrate forage and reduce the risks there. Similar to that would be adapting them much like we do in feedlots and whatnot with, with an adaptation to that higher nitrate as nitrates are 
uh, uh, an effect of the microbial population in the rumen. And so uh, really managing and add, having those cattle adapted, that might look like uh, moving those cattle out onto those annual forages for throughout the day to graze and then taking them off at night and something like that, or as well as strip grazing or rotate grazing through a field, uh, limiting the access to that forage if you do have higher nitrate levels. And uh, uh, additionally, you can also provide an energy supplement that's going to help uh, those microbes process that nitrate. Uh, and so providing, you know, uh, a small portion, maybe a pound or two of, uh, of, of corn, or if you have a, a different energy source, uh, providing that at a lower level will, will help those animals uh, through that higher nitrate forage. Uh, another option would be to take that uh, if you end up harvesting that annual forage uh, uh, and higher nitrate sources, that would be a great option to harvest it as a, uh, uh, as a hay source. And then you can blend that hay source in with some lower nitrate or other feedstuffs to kind of dilute that nitrate. And so uh, those are kind of some overall objectives. Like I said, there's a great resource posted in the chat right now, nitrate poisoning of livestock that can help you work through uh, some of that some of your annual forage questions about nitrates. Thank you, Zach. So find out where you are and then come up with a plan, I think is a, a good idea. Uh, Tim, currently uh, producers in all but five of our counties in North Dakota are eligible for the Livestock Forage Program. Can you share more about that program and other programs for producers who are short on forage? Sure. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first of all, I need to say that I'm a not, not an official USDA FSA representative, and so they have the final say. And so are you, for any particular questions, you need to check with your local FSA office or uh, extension. And FSA is holding a webinar on Monday, June 7th at 11 Central Daylight Time, where you could get your questions answered as well. So I'm just going to hit some highlights. The last two farm bills really streamline our disaster process over the old ad hoc programs that we used to have. It's now based on the U.S. drought. All our programs are all based on the U.S. drought monitor that Adnan showed you. So if you can uh, think of that drought monitor that he just showed you, USDA comes up with a monthly feed cost estimate every year for the different grazing classes of livestock. And I'll talk just briefly about more of that in a minute. And so back to the drought monitor, a county that is in D2 for eight consecutive weeks would get one monthly payment. But if you go to D3 for one week, you re receive three monthly payments. If you go to D3 for four weeks, or D4 for one week, which 48 of our counties are in now, you would get four monthly payments and the maximum is five monthly payments where you would have to be D4 for at least four weeks. And as Adnan said, we're already for 17 counties into a couple weeks of D4 intensity. So the only five counties that do not qualify, as Lisa said, are Cass, Trail, Ransom, Richland and Sargent. And uh, just as way of an example, USDA's monthly feed cost for a beef cow with a calf out in pasture, the monthly feed cost is 31.18, but the program only pays 60% of that. So that brings it down to 1871, $18.71. And then you have a, another deduction for what's called sequestration of a little over a dollar. So a one month payment is 17.64. And so for those 48 counties that qualify for four payments, Payments, it would be 7056. The maximum then would just be adding on another 1764. So uh, it's a little bit more complicated than the CFAP. You need to get into your FSA office and certify the number of pasture acres you have and the number of livestock. And um, uh, FSA has a carrying capacity, so you need enough pasture acres to cover your livestock. Whichever you have the least of, the livestock or pasture acres is what you get paid on. We do have a spreadsheet 
sheet on our uh, NDSU farm management website and it's on the disaster website to help you uh, through that. And, uh, but again, you need to get in to certify with FSA. There has been some confusion in the terminology that says that you have to own the livestock at least 60 days prior to drought. But really, we just got confirmation from the national office. Our drought started uh, for most of those counties, particularly those 48 counties on April 15th. So you just had to own livestock as of April 15th, April 14th or so, uh, the, and that's the number of livestock you certify. The only other uh, one that I'll, program I'll just briefly talk about is CRP emergency grazing and haying. Uh, again, that's automatic to the drought monitor as long as you're in a county, and in this case, even contiguous counties count. As long as you're in D2, you qualify for emergency haying and grazing. The problem is you can't do it during the primary nesting season from April 15th to August virtuous is now unless we have a secretarial designation that allows that and so we uh, do have that for all counties except Richland County for emergency grazing only and emergency grazing would be at 50% capacity. Early haying has not been approved. In 2017, it was approved as July 16th, not saying that'll happen this year, but we are in all except one county eligible for emergency grazing at 50% capacity now. And again, you must see your local FSA office to uh, satisfy all those requirements. So in the interest of time, I'm just gonna stop there and let's move along, Lisa. Okay. So many ranchers have started grazing um, or will in the near future. Kevin, what can they do to achieve optimal production and or reduce the negative impacts to pastures during drought? So, uh, so Lisa, you know, you look at, at, you know, obviously overgrazing is your number one driver in terms of production, in terms of impacts on production and plant vigor. And so, you know, for producers, if you have a grazing system in place, you have multiple pastures, you can create some natural recovery and some rest on those pastures to alleviate some of that overgrazing scenarios. You know, my rule of thumb this year has been if you have an overgrazed pasture, and there's gonna be producers who have, a, who have overgrazed pastures, you wanna defer that next year so you can give those pastures some recovery. If you're starting grazing this year and you have multiple pastures, start in the pasture that had the most amount of recovery last fall, they'll have the greatest amount of, rec of rest and should be the highest in vigor. So you can try to move that overgrazing event around to minimize overgrazing from back-to-back -back years. Our grasslands are very resilient. They can take these heavy disturbance events, but you, do, you want to minimize them to once every year uh, and then once over a four year period on the average. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Kevin. Miranda, um, how can ranchers reduce that potential of overgrazing? Yeah, and Kevin touched on it, you know, the rest and recovery piece, but we do have some tools to help with that, especially during drought. It might, it, things look different. We're not achieving the normal production we're used to. And so it, even if those producers that have a system and are used and know where they're at by eyeballing things, it, it, it's a little more difficult in a drought year. And so we have what we call the great, a grazing monitor stick, which help us, helps um, monitor utilization. So making sure that we're not surpassing that 50% use so that those plants have the ability to regrow if we do get moisture at, a, at time and we can capture some additional growth off of those. So we have that, and then the NRCS actually has a tool that's called the Livestock or Landscape Appearance, which is, it's just going out there. Um, it's, I think, along 100 feet of your area. You walk, you stop and look at how much of the plant immediately in front of you has been grazed. And it's just a way to, another way to measure use and a, you know, visit with your NRCS office. Um, our extension staff, several of them are gonna be trained on that tool next week as well. Um, so those are a couple tools just to keep gauge utilization a little better in, in an odd year. Okay, thank you. So Zach, um, just as we mentioned, many producers are turning out to pasture just as they're starting to green up right now. Um, in, some, in some cases, they're not greening up as you heard from Kevin. Should they be concerned about forage quality right now? And what can they do to ensure they're make, meeting the needs of their animals while they're grazing? More than likely, uh, forage quality, uh, except for maybe some of those extreme areas of drought, uh, would look right now pretty similar to, to previous years of, of what might be expected. 
However, uh, as we know, uh, drought uh, kind of uh, causes that plant to be a little immature for a while, and, and but then we'll, we'll rapidly get into July and August with decrease in forage quality. And, and really, when I talk about forage quality, I'm, I'm, I'm focused on uh, crude protein of that forage, uh, as well as the energy provided. But so uh, with, within regards to crude protein, I think uh, we could we could expect uh, protein levels to be similar to maybe what's expected or slightly lower in June. But then uh, as we as we round out in June and get into July, uh, it, it's uh, more than likely given given our forecast uh, going to be lower crude protein values than uh, previous years or previous to average. And so uh, I think, uh, you know, understanding um, you can't manage what you don't measure. Right, uh, and so having an idea of where your cows are currently in their state, whether uh, in stage of production. So if if we're a couple months uh, past calving or post calving, uh, we're going to get into peak lactation. If we're just about to calve. Uh, you know, having an idea of what that body condition is and having a score uh, uh, for those cows at calving, hopefully, and, and and but if not, having one right now to help us kind of create some of those uh, trigger points where we start implementing things uh, in terms of if we don't get the moisture that we need, uh, we can expect those protein levels to decrease in pasture. So uh, certainly for those larger producers, it's not uh, having a body condition score for all cows, but maybe uh, uh, you know a subset or if you have your cows broken into groups, having 10 to 20% of those cows uh, scored to help you Ha have an indication as you work through the months this this summer and grazing as to what those cows are doing so kind of being consistent and scoring those same cows uh, will help you uh, especially for those larger operations and if you have a smaller operation uh, you should be able to manage uh, having those scores and utilizing those scores of the cows so utilizing that to help you predict when uh, the cows are telling you that forage quality is is on the down and and that uh, you need to uh, bring in some protein supplementation I think really right now looking at the forecast it can be expected that there's going to need to be some supplementation of both protein and energy and so coming up with a plan right now as to when you're going to do that uh, and particularly if we're talking about bull turnout here soon uh, it's really important that cows be uh, on on an elevated plane of nutrition going into breeding so even if you have thin cows right now that's okay uh, we can work through that with some energy and protein supplementation, but uh, uh, certainly need to have a, a good understanding of where you are right now uh, and, and, um, and understand that forage quality is going to decrease as it always does throughout the grazing season, but, but this year more than likely that's going to be sooner rather than later and, then, and, and having a plan for what you're going to utilize for supplementation. Thank you, Zach. Um, Travis. Should our sheep producers be concerned about forage quality and what kind of strategies should they be thinking about as they prepare to graze? Thank you, Miranda. And uh, just to echo some of the things, uh, uh, Zach did a tremendous job in setting that up as well. And so the, the sheep and, and goats as well uh, would share some of those similar concerns of forage quality as we, we would see in cattle, particularly uh, with the, the maturing of kind of our cool season grasses. Uh, one of the things that I would keep into consideration though is that uh, with small ruminants in the generalization is that we have an advantage um, in relation to the management uh, with limited pastures. And so if we think about our producers in the state of North Dakota, uh, a majority of those producers would have under 100 head of, of either sheep or goats. And most commonly that number would be between 20 and 50. With that being said, uh, commonly that's a, a little bit easier to manage. And so one of the things that that comes up here in our, our drought more challenged year of 2021 is that this may be a year that we can invest in some of our portable fencing um, and provide a, a little bit more of an intensely managed approach uh, with either the grazing cells or paddocks. And so as we talked about earlier in relation to water quality um, and just water availability is that if we can have some 
you know, water source available uh, and allow the opportunity to, to utilize some of that portable fencing or electric net fencing, um, then we can be able to, to, to manage the grasses that we do have. Because a lot of the producers that I work with uh, just have a limited number of, of acres if they so do in comparison to some of our, our larger and more expansive uh, beef cattle operators. And so we have some flexibility um, to, to try to manage from there. I'd also say there, as, uh, as Zach touched on in relation to supplementation, is that there are some protein uh, lick tubs and, and protein supplementation that, uh, that can be one of those things that we should keep into consideration. Uh, additionally, one of those things is, you know, if we get behind of making sure that there's some of the, the minerals that are out there for those animals on a, on a pasture standpoint. As we look at it on uh, management right now, and then as he talked to, again, uh, if we had of different stages of production, is that our sheep and goats, for the most part, are, are past our parturition of lambing and kidding. And so one of the things that I would say is that early weaning uh, of, those, of those lambs and our goats, and it's certainly not early if we had uh, our progeny coming in January or February, but some of those that might have them a little bit later in March or April or, or even May, is allow those um, lambs and kids uh, to be weaned uh, because that U is the, the factory and the nutrient requirements uh, necessary for lactation are, are certainly the largest time. And if we can get those uh, animals of, of lambs and kids on their own path towards weight gain and, and market, then we can be able to have the flexibility with the, the U's and does that we have um, to, uh, to try to catch up so that we don't get farther behind in relation to our, our body condition score. And so the other thing is uh, that um, I keep in mind with our, our small ruminant producers uh, is that if, you know, if forage is a concern and we're looking at uh, turnout in relation to pasture is that deworming is an absolute must. And so particular from a parasite challenge, uh, we need to make sure that we are monitoring and, and where our animals are. And as those worms and larva uh, from the parasites go up the grasses, uh, they get consumed and continue that cycle. And so making sure that we uh, provide a dewormer on those here as we close in on June uh, allows us the ability to hopefully make sure that the forages that are consumed uh, are going to the maintenance and growth of those animals and not just to uh, the parasites and worms that we have in the gastrointestinal tract. We have a question, Travis, in terms of early weaning and how old is considered early? <laughs> uh, good question. And so I would say that, uh, that we can do that uh, between uh, 40, to 40, 40 to 45 days or sometime near that. A lot of times we'll take them to 60. Um, commonly 60 would be the number of where we would say home base was. But a lot of people, as, as I've understood, uh, you know, keep them on uh, with those use a, a little bit longer. And so if we can go 30 to 60, I guess would be what one would consider uh, closer to early. Um, but we need to make sure that those lambs are healthy as well. And before we just jump into that, uh, we need to make sure that we are providing a uh, a supplement uh, or at least access to a, a grain or a soybean meal or a, a creep feed for those animals so that it's not just a power transition that catches us on the back end. So when we're making that weaning decision, um, make sure that we provided at least a time period where those lambs and or kids had access to a concentrate diet before we make that decision. And you have to look at that. Again, that's just uh, making sure that we don't get too far behind on our U slash doe um, flock. But if you're in a dry lot operation and you have some feeds, then you're still in an okay spot. It's just if we're gonna move into a pasture, we can get them separated. Thank you. Great, Lisa, shifting gears. Um, many ranchers are actively calling with lack of forage, um, even though we do have poor cattle prices. So what recommendations do you have for cattle producers as they develop those calling strategies? So we have been really fortunate, Miranda, to kind of see an uptick here in, in cow, market cow prices, cold cow prices um, in the last month or so. Um, and so what I encourage producers to do, and I, I think it's a hallmark of 
what I consider to be resilient producers, whether in drought or in flood or just in general operations, is to develop a culling plan based around the goals for your operation. And then start with those cows that don't meet the goals or in maybe Travis's case, the ewes that don't meet your goals. Um, not to step on Travis's toes, but I think we can look at that in a, in a whole operation situation. And so I, I tend to start with the cows that um, have poor quality feet, poor quality udders, cows that are very, very thin, uh, especially if they're late calvers, it might be hard to catch them up in a, a situation where we're short on forage or short on feed. Um, cows that are ornery, mean, there's really no reason to keep them around. Uh, fence crawlers, poor producers. And, you know, you can, I think um, one of, it might've been Zach who said, you can't, uh, you can't manage what you don't measure. And I think it's a great time to talk about keeping those production records. You know, so if you've had a uh, cow that has produced subpar for several years, maybe been a late calver for several years, uh, and, and that's noted in your records, I think that makes an easy uh, choice. Again, you know, poor feet, long toes, um, cows that are lame. Uh, but one of the things that I do think we need to remember is that we wanna make sure that all of our withdrawal times are met. So lots of times, Folks are um, deworming cows as they go out into pasture now or giving some pre-breeding shots. Uh, make sure that you've met those withdrawal times for those animals and make sure that our animals are also able to stand and walk on all four feet and legs and greater than a body condition score of three. Um, we certainly don't want to jeopardize our industry and our image either. So I, I think that those are some good um, places to start. And you know, if you can, knock off what I'd call the low hanging fruit of your herd to, to call. Um, that gives you a good start. And then you can move into some tougher decisions should your uh, current situation merit that. And I, I guess, you know, what, what would be your recommendations, Travis, for your, your producers on the, the uh, sheep and goat side for calling strategies? Uh, thank you, Lisa. And, uh, for, uh, for passing that question in my way as, as well. And so again, uh, I think that that's great information as you talked about the, the low hanging fruit and, and certainly you know managing what you can measure. A couple of things to keep in mind um, here and uh, again, uh, my colleagues and, and hopefully some of the, the attendees know that, that I am an eternal optimist. And so sometime it is going to rain, um, but a couple of things that, that I see as potential things that we can improve from a small ruminant standpoint is, is checking where we're at obviously in terms of just dentition and teeth and seeing if making sure that those are still functional as well. Um, but one of the things uh, also that we keep in mind as we dig through this is uh, some of the times we'll have challenges with the mastitis or just overall utter health or uh, those that are getting a little older uh, can cause challenges just relative to the, to the bags and, and have a lower milking um, a female or, or mother. And so those can happen. And if we can identify some of those of the lower performing um, females and ones that are potentially uh, and or uh, ones that are potentially uh, decreased in terms of that body condition score, those are the ones that, uh, that are lower behind on their body condition score that it's going to be tougher to catch them up. Correct. Uh, if so, if we're lower in relation to the amount of forage that we're going to have, um, some of those I would say that particularly now here as we kind of cross in from May to June is that you want to be ahead of the game. We've had a very strong um, market in relation to uh, both our sheep and our goats. And if we could send some of those marginal use uh, at valuable at up to uh, or averaging truthfully $80 per hundredweight prices. And in fact, uh, we've had places in in North Dakota where they've been 70, 80, 90. And in fact, we had plenty of places that it was over a dollar per pound um, for some of those coal use is that in comparison to our cattle industry is that those coal prices in our sheep and goats are, are at levels that we can consider keeping an extra ewe lamb or an extra doe kid. And so I think that we have an opportunity to make that decision to tighten the quality of our flock. Just as a little bit from that marketing standpoint, if we're gonna make some of those uh, cold decisions and for um, truthfully our young ones as well is that KIST uh, livestock auction sold almost 800 head of sheep and goats uh, just two weeks ago on May 14th. Uh, those li lightweight lambs were nearly $3 a pound. Uh, in fact, we had some at NDSU that were 150 pounds uh, that brought 220. And so we're past Ramadan um, where there was a lot of, a, of strong demand for some of our young animals. 
But one of the things that's changed, and so we can make that decision on whether to cull or whether to sell in relation to our, our young crop lambs, is that the top of the market or that feeder value has decreased some and the um, the price for our fat lambs or, or ones that would be going to a more traditional market has increased. And so there's actually the opportunity to, to feed some lambs particularly uh, that I didn't think was gonna be there um, because the value of those young ones was, was so high. But our lamb supply is tight across America and this becomes a drought that's a lot larger across the US. And so if you saw big brown and red pictures in California, there's a tremendous amount of lambs that come out of California particularly this time. And so where our supply is tight, the feedlots are current, and uh, there is a potential opportunity to, to feed those lands because the retail case is, is strong and food service in the new Northeast and New England area allows us that opportunity. A couple of places if you decide to cull some of those ewes and or goats is that um, Bismarck uh, will be having a, a sheep and goat sale on June 18th. Uh, Kist and Mandan will have a uh, sheep and goat sale on June 25th. And in fact, that was the most prominent one here in the in May with some prices. Bowman has June 7th and 21st. And if we need to reach outside the state for um, either of our Eastern located individuals is that Aberdeen at the Hub City Livestock is June 1st and 8th. And in Purim in Minnesota is June 21st. And so there are some options, um, but certainly I would look at those uh, as we kind of cross into June of making those, those decisions of, of which ones which ones don't need to be part of our program moving forward. Because some of them are gonna be expensive to get back to the body condition score that we'd want. So thanks for letting me offer uh, my thoughts. And, and I think that there is some opportunity to kind of tighten the quality uh, that we have in the, our flock and our herd of goats. I think that's good advice for our, our cattle producers too, Travis. So um, Carl, are there some other management strategies that we can employ as producers or producers can employ besides culling um, to manage their, their, for, their resources, their feed and, and forage resources if those things are becoming tight? Um, you know, once they get some of those cows culled down, but they want to maintain their herd, what are some things they can do? Well, uh, first thing I'd like to pick up on Travis's comment about selective culling. And our cow herds, uh, we're already probably paired out the easy picking fruit now. Another thought would be, maybe we need to really focus on how to depopulate some of our cows by having a 45 day breeding period. Those that are open, we now sell. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that later. We know, wean the calves, sell the cows, feed the calves, that type of thing. And then you're gonna have some bull population then too that we don't need. So the bulls can probably be sold as well. Again, that deals around that issue of depopulation. It's always hard to um, expose cattle for 45 days because you'll see 20 to 30% of the cows not breed, maybe. In a drought situation, there might even be more. But if you want to select your highly productive cows that are good, or good in fertility, uh, that would be one way to do it. Most people would be resistant to it. But this year might be the year if you've still got your cows out on grass and the grass is disappearing, Maybe consider that short breeding period pregnancy test. There's different ways to do early detection of pregnancy. And then at that point, make some hard decisions. So one way is to feed cattle out in pasture. Another way is to feed cattle at home in our yards. We've been doing that here at the Carrington Research Extension Center for 40 years. Not a problem. We've been doing it. It works well. See the size of the calves. They grow well. They look good. Cows are... Uh, content. Uh, it's just providing a good ration to the cattle. You can't underfeed them. You need to feed them adequately. And of course, we prepare for it. So we have feed reserves throughout the whole winter and we keep them from the feed reserves from the year before. So we know we're going to be feeding it through the summer. It might be a challenge this year since people don't have or may not have feed available to them. Well, um, if that's the case, you could try to find some, you could look at a energy dense ration rather than one that's based on all forages, the high quality forages. We could look at some really poor quality forages and add um, grains with it and protein supplements, whatever's needed to or in order to balance the ration. Cattle that are getting enough energy may not develop bad habits in dry lot. And when I say bad habits, when cattle get enough feed to kind of make maintain themselves and produce milk for the calf, they are still looking to do something the rest of the day and need to have something to eat. 
So in our situation, we usually have straw or stover available for them. They don't eat much, but throughout the day, they do pick at it. Maybe they only eat four or five pounds, um, but at least that's something to keep them busy without eating fence posts and dirt or hair off of other cows or other bad things that cows can do. But in a dry lot situation, uh, we've managed it for years. It's not a problem. Um, let's see. One of the things you can look at is uh, early weeding calves. Most people that early wean calves find out, wow, that worked really slick. I thought these calves are gonna turn into a horrible, into a bad situation. No, they work really good. Everybody's got memories of bottle calves that have huge bellies and don't grow very well. That's right. You have to provide lots of milk with a little bit of grass to make calves grow. If you just give them a forage ration without any milk, the calves are gonna develop really big hay bellies and not grow and they're gonna look horrible and they're not gonna have weight gain that you'd expect to have. So it's imperative that you pick up on Travis's comment about having a creep feed or well-balanced feed available for these 300 pound calves that we're gonna wean. Um, it, 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 it's easy to make the feed. Feed manufacturers have these available. Calves need a little bit of room and uh, forage scratch activity to eat. So they need to eat a little bit of hay, but they can eat a lot of grain. When they're replacing grain, when they're replacing milk with grain, they gain well. They'll gain exceedingly well. Most people that have done this are just surprised how well the calves grow and perform, and they don't have these little dink calves that never grow. They have large productive calves at the end of the feeding period. And of course, most people don't want to buy 300 pound calves. So if you do early wean and feed your calves, you're going to end up feeding them to five, 600 pounds. And at that point, you might say, this is pretty slick and easy. We'll just continue. And by that time, fall will have been here with a lower corn price, and maybe you can afford to feed them a little bit longer. Um, one thing you got to remember, if you're feeding an early weaned calf, they eat 3% of body weight on a three-weight calf might be seven, eight, 10 pounds of feed. A cow is going to be eating 40 pounds of feed. So if you're looking at a feed shortage, um, it might be better to feed the calf and you can buy that feed versus trying to find forage to keep your cow herd around. Now, that's early weaning. What do you do with an early weaned cow? If she's open, sell her, right? If she's pred, what do we do? We either got to feed her or we can ship her out of state. Pasture's out of state. It seems like pasture is always hard to find no matter what. So even if you're in Iowa, there's hard to find pasture. They get rain, but uh, they do have feedlots there with grain and other forages where you could feed your cow in another state. Remember, you have transportation costs to take cattle to that and transportation costs to bring them back home. So do the math. You'll find out if you're going to ship them out of state to feed, you're going to be, that's a commitment of three, four, five months in order to make it cost effective. Otherwise, if you're just going to feed them for a month or two, it's cheaper to haul the hay home to the cows than to pay somebody else yardage and mark up to feed your cows someplace else. And if you do do that, just remember, bring your cows home before they start calving. And that should be a month before they start calving because those cows will calve a lot earlier. And if they calve in a feed yard, um, usually the success rate is success rate is kind of low on survivability just because they're not there to calve out cows. Um, there's uh, other things you can do. And one thing I just, I, I got to bring this up. It's the combination of everything I just said. You don't have to do just one program. You can maybe put in the bulls and put them out on one group of cows, or maybe you can do all the cows, or maybe you can ship part of the cows out of state and keep some of them home or depopulate part of the herd. There's lots of options here. And we'll know as the rain falls or doesn't fall, what things we should or shouldn't have done here in the next few weeks. But uh, those are our options when it comes to what do we do with our cows? Wean the calves? Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Carl. Uh, along those same lines, Dr. Stucka, uh, we know producers have had great success early weaning. And so what are some tips that um, we can use to reduce stress on those calves? And uh, when is the optimal time to really look at that early weaning uh, in the calf's age? We'll skip over Dr. Stucka. Um, you know, I think some ways that we can reduce uh, stress in a calf is again, Carl talked about creep feeding that adjusts those calves um, to a concentrate type feed. So they understand what a feed bunk looks like. Um, maybe work on um, 
getting them used to drinking out of a waterer, if you can do that, uh, because lots of times these calves have not seen a water system they're used to drinking out of uh, a creek or a dam or a dugout or something like that. And, you know, I think um, the optimal time is really, it's different for every operation, but it seems that, um, and Carl jump in here, or Zach, but it seems, you know, I think 90 to 120 days has worked pretty well in lots of operations that early wean. Um, I, I can speak from experience in our own operation. We early weaned in 2006 and we're scared to death of it. And now I think it was one of the better decisions we've ever made. Um, and so we have oftentimes done that. Our calves seem to be healthier that year, even in a horrible year um, and did better. So Tim, um, we know that ranchers are making some difficult decisions and trying to reduce their risk during the drought. Um, what are the costs of some of these strategies giving, uh, given our higher feed prices in the cur current cattle market? Yeah, okay, I think the others pretty well covered it, but unfortunately during a drought compared to a normal precipitation year, we're gonna have e either higher costs, lower returns or both. And every producer has a different scenario there. There's not a cookie cutter, one size fits all approach. Usually, and going back to what Carl said, the best alternative is a combination of alternatives. Probably buying expensive feed for everything you have isn't the best option or selling everything all at once isn't the best option. It's a combination of what all the others have talked about. Herd reduction, buying feed, planting forage crops, possibly hauling, early weaning, and, and so on, a combination is the best thing and, and Carl alluded to that. I think our goal, and Lisa, you talked about this, is to keep our most productive cows or ewes in the case, Travis, to maintain a basic production unit. Uh, prices for both cattle and hog, uh, cattle and sheep and, and uh, you know, throw in goats as well are expected to be better in the next few years. We've reduced the cow herd two years and it'll be another year this year and same way on the sheep flock. So uh, supply wise, we're in good shape and demand for lamb as Travis mentioned it, beef is good. So it's important to keep a basic production so we'll be uh, ready for next year and, and when we have ample rain fall and so on. So what, one thought is very important to discuss these alternatives, not just make a, 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 a off the cuff decision, discuss your alternatives with both your ag lender and your tax advisor, because there are significant cash flow and tax implications to both. Don't have time to go through all the tax implications. But for instance, if you sell breeding stock and uh, you don't have to pay capital gains on them if you buy them back the next year, but if you sell breeding stock with the idea of keeping uh, younger heifers or, or ewe lambs back, then you would have to pay uh, a capital gains tax. So all sorts of issues there. Again, I don't have time to get into them. So uh, keep that in mind. And then the other thing is when you're selling anything at a market that's, that's usually you don't do, be sure to talk to your auction market, be that sheep or goats or cattle in advance so they know what you're bringing in. You know, many are holding special sales, particularly on the cattle side where it's a cow calf sale or it might be a way up cow sale or a feeder cattle sale. So don't haul feeder cattle into a, a uh, cow calf or pear uh, only sale. So discuss it with your auction market and then they can do advertising and so on. So those are just some things and I'll uh, turn it back to you, Lisa. Okay, well, I think that's all we have. We don't have any questions right now. And so we've been answering them as we've gone along. If you do have any questions for any of us later, you, we, you can send us an email and we'll be happy to respond to, you, to your questions. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you to all our panelists for sharing their thoughts. And please, again, reach out to your local extension agent with any drought-related questions. Um, the, this, is, this has been recorded. It will be on our NDSU drought webpage probably within a day or so. Um, and then just a couple reminders of a couple upcoming events. Is um, Tim men mentioned this, but June 7th, we'll be holding a webinar with FSA to talk about those drought assistant programs. And that is at 11 a.m. Central. And then our next Navigating Drought webinar is June 24th at same time, so 1 p.m. Central. Thank you again for joining us. We'll see you in a month, if not sooner. And pray for rain. Yes. Mm -hmm.